The bulk of our back catalogue of episodes relates to films released since 1980 or 1990. As such, a lot of them deal with the social and cultural problems of the past few decades, or else they explore history as informed by the modern era. Today, let's jump back a while in time. Like, pretty far back, to be honest. Before the market crashes of the 90s, there was the economic miracle, a period of unprecedented economic growth, which lasted from the 1960s to the 1980s. And before that, there was an era of occupation and reconstruction. Directly after World War II, America maintained a large physical and governmental presence within Japan for about a decade. The changes instituted in this time are thought to have helped the country regain its footing after the war economically, during Japan's period of reconstruction. But we're not going to talk about occupied Japan today. Well, not exactly. No, we're headed even earlier, almost a hundred years earlier, to the 1860s when Japan was in the midst of a different political overhaul. When America was busy with reconstruction following its civil war, Japan was busy in its own state of upheaval. The shogunate, which led what was called the bakufu, or tentpole government, was the military government which effectively deposed the Japanese court and emperor, and which maintained power over the country from 1185 until 1867. The emperor, being the oldest modern hereditary monarchy, never technically left the throne, remaining a symbol of Japan. In reality, during the 700 years under the shogun's rule, the emperor was largely stripped of his power. Under the bakufu, the emperor's governing power was transferred to the shogun. The power of the court was given to the military bureaucracy under the shogun. And the samurai, a class of martial noblemen, was tasked with maintaining law and order on the provincial and local levels. Several eras of rule existed under the shogun, with different families adopting a chain of succession similar to the emperor's own order of ascension. There were first the Minamoto shoguns, led by Yoritomo in 1192, who were eventually rendered victims of their own bureaucracy. Their era of rule was known as the Kamakura period, thanks to its nine shogun reigning from Kamakura, the newly forged military center of Japan. Two princes, Moriyoshi and Narinaga, followed this period during the Kenmu Restoration, a failed attempt by Emperor Go-Daigo to reclaim power for the imperial line. This conflict offered an opportunity for Ashikaga Takauji, a samurai asked to assist in quelling Go-Daigo's rebellion. In fact, Takauji turned against Kamakura and swayed a number of other samurai to join him. Working together, Go Daigo and Takauji joined forces and put down the old military government. By the end of the same year, Takauji had, in a sense, betrayed Go Daigo as well, establishing his own shogunate in the Heian period capital, which is now known as Kyoto. The hereditary line of succession established by Takauji would continue for 250 years, seeing a full 15 Ashikaga shogun reign during what became known as the Muromachi period. The second half of the Muromachi period was composed of the Sengoku Jidai, or Warring States period, kicked off by the Onin War which started in 1467. While the hundred years following the state saw the Ashikaga retaining this title of shogun, Numerous other provincial rulers, known as daimyo, raised their own armies and sought to overthrow the Ashikaga. This protracted conflict entered a new phase, with the ascension of Oda Nobunaga, remembered for centuries now as one of Japan's greatest generals. Nobunaga succeeded where many had failed, in unseating the Ashikaga by first installing a puppet shogun, an Ashikaga willing to acquiesce to Nobunaga before having the final Ashikaga shogun abdicate his position and cede power to Nobunaga's own heirs. Nobunaga's line was cut short by one of his own generals, Akechi Mitsuhide, who forced Nobunaga to commit suicide during the Hotnoji incident, a coup d'etat in 1582. As the Sengoku period wound down in the late 1500s, another brief line headed by Toyotomi Hideyoshi completed Oda Nobunaga's work of unifying the provinces and making Japan a single country once more. Just as with Nobunaga, Toyotomi's line was abruptly ended, along with the Warring States period, in the early 1600s by Tokugawa Ieyasu. Ieyasu seized complete control of the systems and lands which had been hard-fought and hard-won over the preceding century of unmitigated civil war. 
Upon assuming the title of shogun, Ieyasu immediately installed all of his own men throughout Japan's government, securing power over the nation for the sake of his descendants. The 15 Tokugawa shogun would reign in a time of relative peace, known alternatively as the Tokugawa period or the Edo period, thanks to the establishment of a new national capital in Edo, or modern-day Tokyo. While some level of contact was maintained with the outside world through these tumultuous eras, Japan is noted as having been largely isolationist during feudal times, especially under Tokugawa rule. Missionaries and traders hailing from Spain, Portugal, and the Netherlands constituted the bulk of Japan's external contact between the 1500s and the 1600s, leading to, shall we say, complicated outcomes depending on who reigned at the time. By the 1850s, the world at large had begun to economically and technologically outpace Japan. The writing was on the wall, and even the final leaders of the Tokugawa shogunate saw a need for Japan's government to evolve. In 1867, Japan entered a new era called the Meiji period, which was spurred on by the Meiji Restoration. The Restoration was a series of measures meant to modernize Japan and help it to compete with the advancing Western world. Among these changes was the institution of a representative governing body, though admittedly this body was established after a decade of continued political confusion and upheaval. All throughout these numerous periods, in spite of the shogun's de facto power, the emperor had maintained the throne and remained in his position of symbolic power. This restoration sought to cede actual power back to the young emperor, Mutsuhiro, or as he is known posthumously, Meiji. This was largely for pragmatic reasons, given Japan's newfound ambitions for status as a world power. Now that Japan was becoming more open and less exclusionary, its leaders grew aware of how the West had treated other Asian countries up to this point through colonization. Correctly, the leaders predicted that the European powers and the United States would continue to hold an interest in the continental and island nations of the Pacific. Not wanting to fall to the same fate, the late Tokugawa leaders and the newly installed Meiji opened their nation's doors to Western traders. In short order, the Meiji oligarchy and newly established imperial army began to seek their own imperial aspirations. In effect, the idea was to modernize and westernize Japan to such an extent that no western power would dare encroach on their empire. In a sense, this worked, with the world leaders of the early 20th century treating Japan as an equal. However, these ambitions also eventually led to tensions and hostilities that helped to guarantee the country's involvement in World War II. So why have we spent nearly 10 minutes discussing all of this political background and baggage? Sure, it's not all 100% necessary for viewing the film we're looking at today, but Eli is a giant nerd about history and insisted that all of this background be crammed in here. According to him, in the last three years since making the original version of this video, he learned more or less everything we just discussed, and he wanted to dump all of it because of his lack of self-control. That being said, today we're looking at a film set in the time of transition from the Tokugawa shogunate to the Meiji government, a time of feudalism being overtaken by imperial and parliamentary rule. At the same time, this is a film which was released in the time period of arguably greatest upheaval since the Meiji Restoration, in Japan that is, that being the end of the American occupation which followed World War II. Today we'll be looking at the parallels drawn between and the background of these periods explored in Bakumatsu Taioden, or as it's commonly known in English, Sun in the Last Days of the Shogunate. The film was helmed by Yuzo Kawashima, born in Mutsu Aomori on February 4th, 1918. From a young age, Kawashima suffered from ALS, leading to paralysis in the limbs on the right side of his body. Yet, his life story is one of triumph in spite of the odds. At Meiji University, he studied film, and went on in 1938 to work for the major studio Shochiku as an assistant director under Keisuke Kinoshita, a prominent director of the 40s and 50s who, among other things, directed Carmen Comes Home, Japan's first color film. However, upon becoming a full-time director, Kawashima found that his talents were going largely underused at Shochiku. While most of his career was spent with Nikatsu, Kawashima began to work with other studios in the early 60s. In total, he produced 51 films as a director in a brisk 19-year career, with Bakumatsu being one of his most well-remembered, though both the film and Kawashima aren't remembered as well beyond the borders of Japan as they are within the country. 
Kawashima died in 1963 at the age of 45 from pulmonary heart disease, which could have been linked to the ALS he had been fighting since childhood. In his days as director, Kawashima influenced someone we've already discussed on this show, Shohei Imamura. If you'll remember, Imamura was the dean and founder of the Japan Institute of the Moving Image in Yokohama. Takashi Miike, director of numerous projects covered here on the show, served as his assistant director before becoming a full-time director himself. Well, before he made it big as a director, Imamura worked for Nikatsu and served as assistant director to Yozu Kawashima. He also co-authored the screenplay for Bakumatsu with Kawashima and Hisashi Yamanouchi, who later helped write one of Imamura's own breakthrough films, Pigs and Battleships. In 1981, Imamura even remade Sun in the Last Days of the Shogunate, this time titling it Eija Naika, or Why Not? So Bakumatsu, in this way, is only two steps removed from Takashi Miike, a modern director whose pace of output matches Kawashima's. The film is reportedly based on a story titled Saheji Who Stayed Behind. We say story rather than book because Saheji was of a tradition known as Rakugo. Rakugo is a nearly thousand year old theatrical art involving a single orator delivering a story while seated before an audience. Originally, Rakugo was used by monks to inject their sermons with emotion and heighten the interest of their disciples, though by the period depicted in the film, it had mostly evolved into a type of long-winded comedy. You remember the guy from Suicide Club who the other two comedians didn't find too terribly funny? Well, that guy was practicing Rakugo. His lack of props and his use of head turns to indicate change in speaker within the story are par for the course within this medium. And his appearance in a comedy club was not incidental, as a lot of stand-up comics even today get their start in the Rakugo. Frankie Sakai, the leading man who plays Saheji in Bakumatsu Tayoden, was in fact a Rakugo performer before he became a comic. Bakumatsu Tayoden was released in 1957, only five years after American occupation forces had left Japan following the mutual signing of the Anpo Joyaku. Commonly shortened to simply Anpo, this treaty assured cooperation and security between the United States and Japan in future conditions of aggression involving foreign nations. It was seen as a symbol of the American influence during the occupation, and capped off this seven-year period of reconstruction overseen by one of Japan's former foes. The year prior to Bakumatsu's release, 1956, had seen the introduction of an anti-prostitution law which sought to ban compensated sex nationwide, and which forever changed the face of prostitution in Japan. Only a few years prior, the very government of Japan was using brothels as outlets for American GIs stationed in the country. In other words, this was a fairly significant shift for the government and the public, even if it didn't affect your average citizen. As you can see, the film juxtaposes these two periods of change in order to call attention to their parallels. It decides to frame the issue of changing times in the setting of the common people who changes like this will affect the most, rather than in the offices of the high government officials. In this case, within an inn close by the quarters built to house the new foreigners. The center of the film's narrative, then, is one which has been active in Japan for some time at this point, and which the filmmakers saw as changing thanks to the ebb and flow in the tides of politics and foreign influence, both in the period being examined and their contemporary period. In short, the majority of the film takes place within an inn which houses a brothel, and concerns the various employees and clientele therein. In this inn slash brothel, we meet a charming man played by Frankie Sakai, who some might recognize better from his role as Senchan, or Bulldog, in the first Mothra film from 1961, or from the TV miniseries adaptation of James Clavell's Shogun and comedic roles, both of which are displayed in turn throughout the film as he plays the character commonly referred to simply as Grifter or Mr. Grifter. Mr. Grifter ends up at the building with three friends, who all leave before morning at his behest, meaning Sakai's character is left to foot the bill for the room and revelry. One problem though, he doesn't have the cash to cover it. As such, the widowed and remarried wife and her new husband who run the establishment put him to work to pay off his debt. Over the course of the film, we follow the Grifter as he encounters several groups of other patrons. 
Through his charm and wit, the grifter begins to run the brothel for himself in a way. He swindles clients, geisha, prostitutes, and the owners repeatedly, all while appearing to be the good guy in each situation, and making them love him more with each passing day. The majority of the film examines his methods in doing this. Through his eyes, we see Osome and Koharu, two prostitutes between whom a rivalry is in full swing, as they vie to have the most clients, to be the most attractive, really, they'll fight about anything. Osome becomes depressed at one point and decides to take her life, but thinks that she needs a male counterpart so that her suicide is not thought to be due to poverty. She seduces a book salesman, and in a darkly comic scene, sends him plummeting to his death in the sea, before being informed that a wealthy client has arrived, and leaving to attend to him. We see that the book salesman, despite not being able to swim, survives the encounter. We also meet alongside the grifter his male co-workers, who don't take very kindly to the grifter and how productive he is. Through conniving and working with outside forces whom he pays off, the grifter is able to win over even the bitterest of foes. Not all is fun in games, however, as another subplot centers upon a group of samurai holed up in the brothel. This group is roped into their scheme to destroy the foreigners' quarters down the road in an attempt to oust international influence and to maintain Japan's isolationalism in a bout of nationalism. For the disenfranchised samurai, this is an issue of a political nature. As we see time and again with the grifter, however, he has no issue playing one side against the other as long as he stands to profit from it. Over the course of the film, the hilarious grifter works his way into every character's heart, along with the audience, winning their trust one by one, until, at the climax of the film, he has two separate women vying for his attention. In this sense, it seems only appropriate that an actor as charming as Frankie Sakai portrayed our main man. Sakai won the Blue Ribbon Award for Best Actor, a prestigious award given by an association of film critics in Japan. Kinema Junpo, the country's oldest film magazine, awarded him Best Actor in 1958, and also declared the film to be the fourth greatest in Japan of all time in 2009. Despite a relatively small amount of seemingly unrelated things occurring, the film nears the two-hour mark with lengthy scenes, yet never feels overlong. This is thanks to the entire cast's abilities, but especially to Frankie's, as he plays off the numerous moods and settings present within the runtime. Though the grifter is a likable, funny man, there are, at times, comments on his constant cough, with someone saying that he might have tuberculosis. This could be meant to represent several things. His playful, non-respectful attitude could be seen as that of a westerner, an invader in a foreign place. He is not from Shinigawa, the film's setting, and is merely someone passing through, looking to exploit the local populace before moving on to do so somewhere else. The TB, in this case, could be made to represent the foreign nature of his attitude and beliefs, and how infectious they are amongst the locals. On the other hand, it could be said to mean that the grifter represents the state of Japan, both during the periods of the film's setting and its production. We see him multiple times brewing folk remedies for his TB, though none of them ever seem to help his cough much. He never gets better. Despite his lack of improvement in terms of health, he stands by these old habits and rituals, not even entertaining the idea of partaking in other medications. This could be said to represent Japan's habit of assimilating foreign ideas and methods, yet maintaining distinctly Japanese habits in a lot of cases. The titles given for the film in English are quite often not literal translations, with the most common being Sun in the Last Days of the Shogunate. This one is pretty self-explanatory, as the film explores the period towards the end of the Shogun's reign. Others dub it Shinagawa Path, which makes sense given that the film is set in Shinagawa. But the literal translation of Bakumatsu Taioden often cited is a Sun Tribe myth from the Bakumatsu era, with the Bakumatsu being the end of the Edo period, and Taioden being Sun Myth. The Sun Tribe, or Taiozoku, films were an up-and-coming genre of raucous youth stories blossoming in the late 50s and early 60s. Often, the list of Sun Tribe films intersects with the likes of more than a few directors from the Japanese New Wave, who perhaps saw in this violent, sexualized, liberated genre a means of expressing the pent-up rage that would come to embody their movement. Season of the Sun and Crazed Fruit 
both produced by Nikatsu the year before Bakumatsu Taioden, marked the beginning of the Sun Tribe movement. Ishihara Yujiro, the star from both films, appears in Bakumatsu Taioden as Ishihara, the samurai leading the plot to burn down the foreigners' quarters. Yoko Minamita, who plays Koharu, one of the two rivals in the film, had appeared previously in Season of the Sun, and is perhaps best known for her role in Nobuhiko Obayashi's 1977 horror comedy, House. Sakaichi Hidari, the other rival, would later appear in Shohei Imamura's The Insect Woman and Paul Schrader's Yukio Mishima biopic Mishima, A Life in Four Chapters. This use of young actors who had ties with revolutionary filmmakers and the Sun Tribe films of the era seems to further the idea that Kawashima was being critical of the contemporary state of Japanese society, as these Sun Tribe films, especially at the beginning, served as early examples of Japanese films gaining the ire of the government. If Bakumatsu Taioden is actually a commentary on post-war Japan, how true is it to the pre-Meiji era? There are several points upon which we can touch here. First, in 1873, Japan introduced a conscription law, requiring three years military service of all able-bodied men. At this point, the samurai had not yet been abolished, meaning that the situation we see in the film of a military living alongside a class of disenfranchised, disillusioned samurai was a reality. By 1877, however, the last rebellion of the samurai against what they perceived to be the wrongs of the new military system had been fought, and the samurai were quashed forever, a victory that had been won by the sheer number of men sent by the army to fight a relatively small group of rebels who had no backup. Next, we have the inclusion of prostitution on a fairly large scale here. A common misconception is that geisha are effectively a class of prostitute, and it's important to understand that this isn't the case, despite what popular understanding of Japanese culture might lead some to believe. Geisha are more similar to the members of a modern-day host or hostess club in Japan. They are trained extensively in music, singing, dancing, art, and more. Which is why, throughout Bakumatsu, you'll see some of the women playing the shamisen, a traditional two-string Japanese instrument, and singing, while others simply travel from room to room without much artistic prowess. This is one way to differentiate the geisha from the prostitutes in the film. There's another, more subtle difference between the two occupations as well, and that is the way in which they wear their kimono. The obi, as the sash, which is used to hold their clothing is called, is tied according to need. Geisha have their obi tied in the back, as it requires that someone else tie it for them, and they have no need to remove it, while the prostitutes have their obi tied in the front so that they may tie and untie it themselves in order to more easily dress and undress for each client. Geisha training is extremely rigorous and time-consuming, being done in three stages. The first stage, called shikomi, we can observe by the women who seem to be kitchen workers in the scenes with the owners. These women are being formally taught the art of hosting, essentially, while completing the daily tasks of preparing tea and other maid-like duties. The second stage, Minarai, is a time in which the aspiring geisha will follow a big sister and get observational field experience in hosting. The final stage, in which the woman becomes a proper geisha, sees a dichotomy, where she either mainly dances or sings and plays shamisen, as is seen in some of the film's early scenes. Thus, the whole process comes full circle, and the industry of geisha as hostesses supports itself through its own education system, with the shikomi and minarai assisting with daily duties, while the full geisha entertain the guests, which is fully observable within Bakumatsu Taioden. Another historical aspect of the film which may appear minor, but which deserves attention, is more cosmetic than anything. You might have noticed that several of the geisha and prostitutes throughout the film seem to be missing teeth. This is thanks to the film being in black and white, while their teeth have actually been dyed black in a type of body modification called ohaguro. The practice of ohaguro has been documented as far back as the Heian period, though it is theorized to have started even earlier. The practice was used at length for the daughters of government and military officials to denote class and eligibility for marriage based on age. The practice fell out of favor towards the time of the Meiji period, when it became viewed as being relegated to married women, prostitutes, and geisha. Notably, however, Emperor Meiji himself was never drawn, painted, nor photographed with anything more than a stern smile, which obscures the fact that he also had his teeth blackened, making him the final emperor of Japan to undergo the process. 
In 1870, among the restrictions created by the Meiji government in order to modernize and westernize Japan, Ohaguro was outlawed entirely, and white teeth came into vogue. The intent of Ohaguro is not entirely clear, though it has been postulated that it may have related to the sexual maturity of a woman, and the coming of age when one would seek a husband. Others have commented that the white face makeup, common particularly in the Heian period, could cause the perception that a woman's teeth were yellow comparatively, and that the blackened teeth would counteract this assumption. In addition to providing some apt history lessons and parallels, Bakumatsu Taioden also offers some unique symbolism that we ought to explore. Throughout the first part of the film, many characters discuss the oncoming festival in honor of the fire god, Kagutsuchi. In Shinto legend, at Kagutsuchi's birth, he killed his mother and, in turn, was killed by his father. The eight sections of his body that were cut by his father became eight of the volcanoes in Japan, and the residual blood droplets from the act created the rain and sea gods. It could be easily said that Kagusuchi is here being used to represent the American occupation in the decade before the film's production, with the residual gods and volcanoes being representative of the American ties and military bases left behind when the Americans had officially left the country. The characters of the film make a big deal out of paying tribute to the fire god, or the Americans, who are now gone perhaps even representing the foreigners the samurai seek to kill in their conspiratorial plot. This in turn harkens the end of Japanese isolationalism and individual culture, as the country moved towards Americanization and Westernization both during the Meiji period and post-occupation eras. You might have also noticed the prevalence of talk about killing crows. Specifically, one of the samurai states that he wrote a song about killing a crow, a song which a geisha then sings, and the grifter repeats much to the samurai's chagrin. In Shinto mythology, the crow was a symbol of guidance, most notably with the example of Yatagarasu, or the eight-span crow, the crow sent from heaven to guide Jimu, the first legendary emperor of Japan, on his journey across the country. The crow itself is also representative of rebirth within Japanese symbology. This could suggest that, in wanting to kill the crow lyrically, the samurai and other Japanese citizens echoing his words are seeking to upset the directive of the foreigners, as they are literally trying to destroy the foreign quarter. Taken more pessimistically, the killing of the crow could represent the blissful ignorance that Yuzo Kawashima may be accusing the contemporary Japanese audience of partaking in by not sticking to their course of Japaneseness, and instead bowing to westernization, effectively forsaking the directive from heaven and quote-unquote killing the crow. For the longest time, Bakumatsu Taioden was unavailable to Western audiences, but luckily for us, the film was remastered recently for Nikatsu's 100th anniversary celebration and released on DVD and Blu-ray. It's not easily available in America, but it has been released in the UK under Eureka's Masters of Cinema label, and the Japanese release contains English subtitles. This might make getting your hands on a copy a bit more difficult, but we highly recommend Bakumatsu Taioden to anyone who is looking for a laugh a history lesson, or just a great film. It's a hilarious piece of filmmaking, and it is certainly worth the effort needed to track it down. <laughs> 